Hi there, Toy here, and I'm actually going to do some book reviews. So I am going to be filming a video that is an extension of a video that I filmed for my other channel. So over on my Toy Thomas channel, I am I do a monthly wrap up, at least I try to, <laughs> um, of all the books that I've read in a month for my Goodreads reading challenge. Now, one thing I've never really done is actually done video book reviews. So I'm trying something new. So in the month of January, it was probably one of the slowest reading months I've had in a really long time. But you know, it's the beginning of the year. I had a lot going on with work, vacation, side businesses, all that kind of stuff. So here's what I read. I read Monstress Volume 2, The Blood. That is a graphic novel. I gave it a five star. I read On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft. That's nonfiction by Stephen King. I gave that five stars. I read The Luck Bucket. That is a anthology, a collection of short stories um, based on the um, Outer Banks, North Carolina, Virginia region and written by local authors. I gave that four stars. And then I read Murder at the Marina, a Molly McGee cozy sailing mystery series number one, and I gave that five stars. So let's actually get to the reviews. So Monstress is the second book in the series that I've read. It is a graphic novel series and I love it. The artwork, I mean, I can't even let me just read the review and it'll hopefully explain some of it. The subtitle for this collection is On Point. There is so much blood in this and yet somehow it is still beautiful. I can't give this illustrator enough credit. The story is good on its own, but the images catapult it to another level. This installment covers issues 7 through 17. It really brings out the darkness of the dark fantasy. This book brings the whole series, I assume, into the realm of smart horror. This isn't just a scary or frightening tale, it is a complex epic of historical and magical themes to serve as a cautionary <laughs> um, ride against hubris, vengeance and revenge, and the pursuit of truth and power. I got very wordy with this one. <laughs> I like Maiko more in this one, that's the main character though she's not my favorite character. I feel for her more in this one than in the first one as we get to see more of her past and understand why she is who she is. Even the monster inside her seems more relatable than that's literal people, uh, whether likable or not. The little half fox and the necromancer cat fill in the remaining gaps of my heart and keep me invested in, in the darkest moments. They are, for me, critical to the overall appeal of the story because this is a very dark story. I'm not much into um, gore and horror, but for some reason, this series really pulls me in because even though it does have those dark things and some of there are a couple of like just, you know, short, gory things about it, there are these light moments and those really help me get through the series. I'm reading my review, but I'm also adding things to it as I'm reading it. So the end of this installment for me was a bit of a cliffhanger, but that is to be ex uh, expected in an ongoing saga. I can only imagine what the coming volumes will reveal about Moriko, that's the main character's mother, who's still a mystery despite the revelation of her sinister motives in Maika's birth. I'm not going to go into that because if I do, that would be a spoiler, but there is something to what I just said. So this is where I'll stop fearing of giving away spoilers. This is an excellent follow-up to the first in the series, and I look forward to more. Highly recommend it to mature dark fantasy fans. Um, I guess this can be classified as a YA story because the main character is young, and there's a lot of young characters in it, and I think it's written for that demographic, but the content for me personally is very adult. But I mean, I see what kids watch on TV, so whatever, <laughs> you know, um, but it's a really good series. I love the artwork. I mean, I, I think I said this with the first book, like there are certain pages that I could just, you know, rip out of the book, which I won't, but I could just hang them on the wall. It's like pieces of art. Let's look at the next thing I read, which was 
on writing by Stephen King. Now, this was actually the IWSG book club book. Um, we do we read a nonfiction book that's about the craft in some way. We've read, you know, other like writing skill books. We've read screenplay books, different things that could just help you as a writer. And then we also will read a fiction book that represents something about the craft that's done really well, whether that be dialogue or descriptions or something like that. So this was obviously one of the craft books that we read. So here is the five star review. I enjoyed reading this book, which says a lot since I struggled to read memoirs and writing skill books. Wow, I did write that. Okay, the first part of this book is the memoir portion that explains how Stephen King became the writer he is. The second part is filled with his insights to help young or aspiring writers. Learning about King's childhood helped to explain where and how the ideals for his haunting stories come from. I appreciate that King's story isn't one of overnight success, but one that involves a lifelong love of writing where hard work and skill paid off. I love that he advocates reading as a major component to being a good writer. And let me just pause for a moment to say that I have met so many writers online, not necessarily ones in person, who have said they just don't have time to read. And I think that that statement is so detrimental to just the reading society, like in general, to say that you don't have time to read, but yet you plan on writing a book that you expect people to read just doesn't sit well with me. Maybe you don't have time to read a lot, like add, add a lot to that. And I'm okay with it because not everybody has time to read a hundred books a year. But if you read one book a year, you read. I feel like if you're a writer, you should probably maybe read a little bit more than that. Reading actually helps you hone your skill, but let me get off my soapbox and get back to my review. I don't agree with everything King offered in the area of writing skills, but since King is much further along in his career than I am, I can at least respect his ideas and find value in them, and that's true. He praises his ability to write without much plotting, but I think that's more of a personality trait than a writing rule or a guideline. Some writers will be plotters and others will be pantsers. Simple as that. And, and what I mean is that he, I mean, he does in his book, he talks about how he doesn't really plot. He just kind of writes the story and that's fine. Most writers fit into the category of either being a plotter or a pantser. And I don't think there's anything wrong with one or the other. It's just, I think it's really more of a personality thing. Um, I don't feel like he was preachy about it, but there were a couple of times where I was wondering if he would maybe turn some writers off by saying that, but I don't think that's what he was saying. I just, it, I just think he was saying that's what, that's the way he writes. At one point, King says that theme develops from good stories and not the other way around. I can see some truth in this. A good story will have engaging themes in it by the nature of it being a good story but i don't agree that a good story can't start with a theme i've written many stories with the theme in mind first while i don't have the accolades of king i do believe other highly acclaimed writers have likely at some point wanted to say something or emphasize the theme and then create a great story to put that message out into the world and that's true. I, there are some people who are like, oh, I hate theme, 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 theme. When I think a lot of times what they hate is that person's style of writing. Some people have a very preachy style of writing and it may not even be the theme that's bothering you. It's just the fact that everything that you're reading seems like they're trying to convert you or get you to believe something. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but again, some people do prefer stories that don't have a message to them. And that's fine. Back to my review. <laughs> I admire I admire that he is honest and unapologetic about who he is and what he writes, even if it offends someone. He never sets out to offend people. It just happens sometimes. But isn't that the case with anyone who shares creative work with the public? Show sure enough. I love his list of reading recommendations at the end of the book. Literally, the man has like pages of like books you should just read. Um, I was not King's number one fan when I started this book, and I'm still not, but I do respect him more than I did before. 
I don't have to be his number one fan to like the stories that I like and not like the ones I don't. I respect him as a great writer regardless. Highly recommended to writers at various stages, memoir enthusiasts, and fans of Stephen King. So yeah, I enjoyed the book. I thought, I'm glad I read it. Maybe I'll read it again one day. So the next book I read was the one that I was probably the most excited about in the month of January, and that was The Luck Bucket because I actually went to an event in the fall, which I think I did actually a video for where I talked about how I met some of the authors who contributed to it, which that was fun. On Goodreads, I have it listed as a four-star review, but then whenever I actually posted the review, I did say that, you know, I actually would have given it a 4.25 if I had been able to. I think there used to be like some kind of um, rating system where you could give, you know, 0.5s and things like that, but that went away a long time ago. So I still list those sometimes. So let's look at my review for The Luck Bucket. I really enjoyed this collection and will likely read it again when the weather is more conducive to reading on the beach or by the pool. There were a few things that kept me from loving this collection, but I still really liked it. I admit the delicate nature of an anthology with so many contributing factors such as various authors, possible editors can result in semi-satisfaction more often than not, but I think this team did a great job. And that's true. To get an anthology, you do run the risk that you're going to love one story and then the very next story can be a total dud. You just don't know. But I also think that's what makes anthologies fun. So first, here's what I loved. I love the collaborative feel of the collection. All these stories can easily stand alone, but I adore how they were all so connected and not just by the luck bucket. I enjoy reading about stories that take place close to my hometown with references to cities in my area. I enjoy the diversity of the characters without cultural or racial differences being made into an issue unnecessarily. And that's true. Um, the approach to cultural and racial diversity was handled realistically and practically, and I really appreciated that. Um, it's true. I feel like sometimes people add in characters of different like cultures and races and beliefs or genders and things like that just so that they can say that it was in there and I don't really like that but this the way the diversity of this collection was it just seemed very natural and that's what I appreciated and lastly I enjoyed the genre blending that seemed to happen seamlessly from one story to the next while they were all romance first it was nice to see subtle touches of suspense paranormal and fantasy here and there. So yeah, the collection is mostly um, a romance collection, but um, there are some subtle hints of other things happening. Nothing like overshadows the, mo the main theme of romance though. So that's just um, good for you to know if that's a concern when you're reading. So now I'm gonna <laughs> get to the part of the review that says what I didn't love about it. Now, what I had trouble with was the unrealistic abundance of gorgeous blondes. At least they were mostly men. I think every single one of the stories had a gorgeous blonde in it. And I think one story may have had two or three gorgeous blondes. <laughs> I don't know. It just, I just kept thinking the whole time I was reading it that um, Tim Burton's Batman was going to jump out somewhere because that was like a thing in the Tim Burton Batman movies was they always had to have like a hot blonde, you know, it was Kim Basinger, Michelle Pfeiffer, then I think, um, oh, what's her name? I can't, Nicole Kidman, like that. So that's what I was kind of, it kind of, it did, it kind of affected me, my reading, because I kept thinking about all the gorgeous blondes, but most of them were men, which I also thought was kind of funny, it was all these like surfer dudes with long blonde hair, and I get it, they're at the beach, okay. But yeah, I just, I was like, whoa. In one of the stories, I felt that the ending was a bit cliche, considering the buildup seemed to suggest something more progressive and dramatic. A woman finds a way to fit herself into a man's life because he refuses to inconvenience himself. I just felt like the great love this man was feeling wasn't so great. He never even considers going to track her down or make any sacrifice to be with the woman he supposedly loves 
yet she has no problem altering her lifelong dream to be with him. It was disappointing. And so I'm not going to elaborate a whole lot on that because I don't want to give away spoilers. I, I do want to clarify, though, that every single book in the anthology I enjoyed, I liked. I just didn't like the ending of this one particular story. It was it was disappointing. So next, um, and while I enjoyed the last story, and I'm thinking of the last story in the collection, um, the timing of the delivery seemed off. Characters were introduced and began development without physical descriptions, only for physical descriptions to be added later. I did that once in a story and was glad that someone called me out on it. So yeah, with that one, it wasn't like a major problem, but I had already started to kind of form how I thought the characters were going, like how they looked in my head because of the way it was written. And then later on, more detailed descriptions were given about the characters and they didn't look the way I was imagining them in my head. This kind of goes back to my last review with um, Stephen King. He doesn't like to give descriptions, which I don't have a problem with. I feel like you have to have one or two viewpoints when it comes to descriptions. You either keep this description simple and vague so that the reader can imagine the character themselves, or you give explicit descriptions so that they see the character the way you want it to look. You can't do both. That's not consistent. And I'm not saying that's what happened here, but I'm saying like if you're writing a novel and you describe some of your characters, but not all of them, it's confusing. Tangent, back to the review. Still, despite the few things that kept me from loving this collection, I liked the experience of reading it and will likely read it again. There are some mature, there is some mature content in this collection, though nothing that I feel warrants a strict warning. However, it is definitely for, adult, for adults or mature um, young adult readers with parent permission. Recommend it to fans of short fiction, romance, and stories from OVX, the region of Virginia, North Carolina. So yeah, this is um, definitely adult fiction. I don't, you know, I just wanted to make sure, like, you know, kids aren't picking it up and trying to read it. I try not to predict what teens are reading these days, but it does have mature content. So, I mean, if your parents are okay with you watching it on TV, they're probably okay with you reading it. That's not my call. I just give you the recommendation. <laughs> All right, and so the last thing I read was the um, Murder at the Marina, uh, Molly McGee Mystery Number One. So this this review is very short. I'm just gonna read it, and then if I have a comment, I'll make it because it's 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 simple. I started this series in the middle, and I'm playing catch up with this book. I really enjoyed going back to see Molly's first murder, even if it wasn't her first mystery. I kind of read the prequel before this one. Oops. This is a fun story. Molly and Scooter are so cute together as they eat copious amounts of chocolate and bump heads over whether a sailboat has a place in their life, especially when people keep showing up dead around them. The description of this book sets the scene perfectly, but it does leave out some funnier redhead comments and dramatic, test from, uh, dramatic texts from Molly's mom. Um, I like I liked officially meeting the members of Coconut Cove, though I'd already encountered them in other books in the series. Still, it's always nice to know more about characters, especially when you already like them. I think the one thing I appreciated more than any other with this book was that I didn't figure out who the killer was too early. Jacobson really got me on this one. Highly recommended to fans of Cozy Mysteries, Humor, and this series. So that's pretty cut and dry. Um, it's just a fun little series. I don't think it's anything to like take too seriously. If you're not into cozy mysteries, like if you're into something more hard and gritty, I can't really recommend it for that. But if you do like a light cozy mystery reading and you do like humor, then yeah, go for it. So the books that I'm currently reading now is book two in that series, which is Bodies in the Boatyard. And I'm reading a nonfiction book called Black Gun Silver Star about Bass Reeves. So hopefully next month, those two and whatever else I get done in the month of February, we'll have a review waiting for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. And that's all I have for now. Bye-bye.